Poorer, poorer customers. Is agriculture ready? That's the question we're asking in this episode of the Business of Agriculture. Hey, Damian Mason here with a question before we hop into this episode of the Business of Agriculture. If you farm for a living, you employ a lot of amazing technology from your inputs that you put into the soil to the tractor that you sit in, your combine, and the amazing data that it harvests. But has your soil analytics kept up technologically with everything else in your farming operation? I would venture to say that no, it is not. Sure, you check for your nitrogen, your phosphorus, and potassium, your micronutrients as well. But what about disease pressure? Do you know what diseases and what pests you're going to face next year? No, you don't. But you can now figure that out with Pattern Ag's predictive analytics. Think about it. They can tell you now with testing what the likelihood of facing nasty diseases, things like cyst nematode or uh, sudden death syndrome, what the likelihood of you having this in your field, then you know how to prepare, how to treat, and where to invest your money. It's using technology to make you bigger yields and therefore make you bigger money. Go to www.pattern.ag to learn more. They are pioneering the way in predictive agronomy. Hey there, welcome to another fantastic episode of the Business of Agriculture. I'm joined by my buddy and friend and co-host of the Business of Ag Success Group, Todd Thurman. Um, we get together and we have great conversations. We just talked and talked and finally I said, let's get this thing recorded because we're going to run out of time. Um, we're talking about older, poorer customers. One year ago, he and I shot a podcast show and we talked about aging and shrinking population. We talked about the demographics. If you are not aware of that, if this is the first time you listen, go back and listen to it because we are going to have less humans to feed by the year 2050, contrary to what you've been told, feed the world, feed the world. More importantly, we're going to be getting older. We are getting older. Median age in the United States of America is up about 12 years from what it was when I was born in 1969. If you're young, you're saying, that's a long time ago. Well, it's only half a century ago. We've gotten almost 12 years older in the United States, almost 12 years older on median, meaning half below, half above, in the last half century. That's big. We're getting older. Todd and I are going to talk about what older and poorer customers means for agriculture, because frankly, it's another blind spot we see in agriculture, we're going to get, I won't say blindsided, but we're going to get definitely uh, caught short on this whole topic. Todd, you and I have talked a lot about it. Older and poorer customers. I'll cover the poorer. You can talk about older. Uh, where are we? Well, around the world, pretty much everywhere uh, we're aging. In some places, we're aging very rapidly. So if you look at uh, China, for example, where I've done quite a bit of work and quite a bit of analysis. Uh, I think that is probably the fastest aging society in human history. I, I can't find another one yeah, I've, that I've, would rival I've, I've read that. And Japan is the oldest because they stopped having kids, geez, in the 80s. Uh, with their vast industrialization and rapid expansion of economy through the 60s, 70s, 80s, they are the oldest country. China, just across the, the Sea of Japan, is the most rapidly aging country. So, And then, uh, as we've talked about also, South Korea is the almost least uh, fertility country with only a 0.8% fertility rate. So there's a lot of stuff happening in that part of the world. We're happening. It's happening all over, though. The whole world's getting older, particularly where we where agriculture has as a customer base. North America is getting older. Europe is getting older. Asia is getting older. Yep. And some of that uh, aging is is mitigated by immigration in North America and in a few European countries. But in a big chunk of, of Europe, especially Eastern Europe, uh, Russia, and pretty much all of East Asia, we have a pretty rapid uh, aging of the population. And so obviously you start looking at, well, no matter what your commodity is, you start looking at uh, exports and you're going to find a lot of East Asian uh, customers pretty high on that list. So the fact that the the whole world is is aging with the exception of, of Sub-Saharan Africa is aging fairly rapidly and they're aging the most rapidly in some of the most important export uh, customers that we have for uh, exports of uh, ag commodities. It's definitely something we need to be paying attention to. So it's happening here. It's going to impact our market, you know, our domestic market here in North America. Um, but even faster, it's going to show up in our export markets. For the industry that we both are uh, made our career in agriculture here in North America, we've talked about China endlessly for the last 20 years. Starting about the, after Y2K, China started coming on. Then they were this economic dragon. You know, we've, we've heard about it for 20 years. 
they're not going to be there forever. You and I have covered that, and and I've talked about it in past episodes. So let's talk about what the reality is. They're getting older, and we're getting older. I'm just going to give you some numbers about the United States. The United States population is older today than it's ever, but these are from uh, uh, these are real legit stuff uh, from the census, uh, and then also uh, an organization called PRB that does a lot of demographic studies. The United States population is older today than it has ever been. Um, between 1980 and 20. To 2022, the median age of the population increased. And I told you that uh, we're now 39. That's our median age. Median median age, 39. Uh, again, when I was born, it was 27. Um, and uh, uh, one third of the states in the country have a median age above 40. Uh, so some of the states are getting really, really old. The older population is becoming uh, a little bit more diverse. You know, that's for immigration, et cetera, et cetera. But here's the big one. Number of Americans ages 65 and older is going to increase from 58 million to 82 million by 2050. So you're talking about a vast amount of our population that's going to be over age 65. This gets it close to a quarter, 23 percent. And that's, I think, uh, a slam dunk. I mean, based on what we're already having, 10,000 baby boomers from the generation that was born between 46, 1946 and 1964, 10,000 of them are turning 65 every day in the United States. Yeah. So if you look at just the way demographics works, if you look at projecting the population 65 plus in 2050, that's we can be very accurate. We can be very confident in yeah. those numbers. So that's almost certain to happen. Now, how many babies people are going to be having, yeah. you know, 10 years from now or 20 years yeah. from now? Yeah, based on death rates, et cetera, unless unless God forbid a nuclear holocaust was upon us and then, you know, they they blew up Florida where a lot of old people are. Barring something like that, we can pretty much look at these demographics, talk about that. So while we are asking a question and why I said you should come on here, you and I love the demographic discussion. I don't think agriculture is ready. I think we're okay because we're pretty adaptable, but we're not in any way. Our mindset isn't there. Um, Old people eat less. You're going to give us a bunch of data on that. Old people eat considerably less by the time they're in their 70s. They eat, you're talking like they eat like one third or, or half as much, you know, one third or one half less than they do. So we're talking about consumption, what they eat, the types of foods, packaging. About 75 or 80 percent of uh, women that are over 75 years old live alone. So you're talking about small portions, individually packaged. You're talking about completely different dietary mix. You're talking about a loss of caloric consumption, which means feed, feed, feed the world is going to be like, well, yeah, now our, our customers are eating considerably less calories. We're we're going to get hit. It's not going to happen tomorrow. It's going to happen the day after tomorrow, right? <laughs> it's coming. And it's going to yeah, be a very different marketplace. Yeah, it, it, it's already here and it's not going to happen overnight in the sense that it, you know, it's the kind of thing that builds. It's not like you just all of a sudden the population ages 20 years o- overnight, um, but it, it's already here. We're already beginning to see some of the impacts. And just to reinforce what you said, compared to recommendations, a 60 year old will be recommended to eat about eight to 10% fewer calories than a 40 year old of the same height and weight. By the time they get to 80, you're talking about 10 to 15% less. And that's versus recommendations. So that's, you know, so that would be, we would, we would, we would expect them. We would hope that they uh, eat 10 to 15% less by the time they get to, to 80. But, and we start looking at what they actually consume, older people tend to underconsume versus recommendations, and middle-aged and younger people tend to overconsume versus recommendations. And so, what we look at there is as many as some studies have shown, eighty percent plus of people sixty-five and over are consuming less than the recommended amount of calories. So they're already supposed to consume less, and they're underconsuming versus younger people that are supposed to consume more and are overconsuming. Yeah, so as yeah. that younger population, you know declines and the older population increases, we're talking some very significant potential, you know, shifts in in eating patterns that have obviously a, a major implications for food and ag. Yeah, I mean, and, and this is, I know it's, everybody's listening to this, very smart people, that's why they tune in the business of agriculture. We, we are in the business of calorie production. And so we're talking about 
and we'll talk about the different types of things. You've got some cool stuff on protein that you want to share about recommendations in general. Uh, unfortunately, m- many old people under consume protein. That's why they start losing muscle mass, et cetera, which is part of the aging thing. But the point is, if you're talking about a deduction of 10% of calories, you know, just because of aging, like the numbers you talked about, if you're, you're talking about 10% le- fewer calories, that's an amazing amount of bushels. That's an amazing amount of pounds uh, coming out of the the the, the Wilson, uh, the the Tyson uh, meat, meat processing facility in Logan Sport, Indiana. You're talking about 10% or less calories across 340 million people is a shitload of calories. Yeah. And so, you know, some of that's going to be mitigated in these countries where, you know, like the U.S. that are going to continue to grow because of immigration, right? right? So, you know, essentially when you look at the numbers and you start projecting what's going to happen there and how that aging population is going to impact it, in the U.S., it's a matter of of growing slower over the next, you know, 25 years. In China, that has a declining population, you have both a declining population and a rapidly aging population. Yeah. And so you're talking about bigger reductions than you might otherwise expect. So um, it can, yeah, it can have really in those scenarios, it can have massive impacts and it's having massive impacts here too. It's just being obscured by the fact that we're, you know, over the next, you know, 75 years or so, we're expected to bring in a lot of, of immigrants to help, you know, address well, our we, we labor already issues. Are. We already are. And it's, it's, uh, it's obviously a hot, hot potato issue, but you know, legal or illegal, we've got uh, a lot more people here from foreign countries. Let's talk about the older consumption, though, um, because you know I, I bring this up to my audience: is a sixteen-year-old eats a heck of a lot different than a sixty-year-old, very and definitely more than a seventy or eighty-year-old. So you've got some stats about the protein. It might be a good thing for our protein uh, industry if elderly people start adhering to us. You've got that, but I just want to continue to harp on the fact that look at the industries that have. Um, you know, fluid milk. Old people don't drink milk. Little kids do, right? Uh, with cereal, et cetera, et cetera. So there is some adaption where they went to cheese. You know, we consume more dairy today than we did 50 years ago, but it's not through fluid milk. It's because we've gone from eating about four or, four or five pounds of cheese per American to like 20. So that's a good thing. And I think that that, that tees up well for dairy because of the aging. I don't think that it does so much for steak. I don't know that I see 75-year-old uh, women eating steak. So I want to ask you about your thoughts on the protein. Well, you, you, before I jump into that, you, you mentioned uh, you, you referred to 75-year-old women. And I think that's an important thing to point out, too, that yeah, as I did, these populations- I didn't be in any way sexist. It's just that by the time you get to 75 or 80, much more of the percentage of the population in that age group are women. You can tell them why. <laughs> Yes. And so uh, because of differences in life expectancy, as the population ages, it tends to become uh, much more female. So in the 25 to 49 uh, age group uh, globally, uh, about 48.2 percent of the population is female. But by the time you get to 65 plus, it's 60 percent. So uh, you go from 48 percent to 60 percent. And by the time you get to 80, it's 70 percent. So, I mean, that's a pretty staggering idea if you're talking about 80 plus being a very rapidly, the, arguably the rap, the fastest growing demographic in the world. Right. That, you know, no, means not only is 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 that population getting older, but it's going to be getting disproportionately female. And that has obviously implications because the average female consumes about 23% less calories than the average male, just because of, uh, you know, metabolic and uh, height and weight. Uh, yeah, height and weight, yeah, they, they tend to be, yeah. So, so when you're talking about 80 year old, which there are going to be a whole bunch more 80 year olds. And I said, yes, a, an older woman, I'm not in any way being, uh, be mean to grandma. It's just, that's what the, that's what aging does. We're going to have yeah, like you said, that's an that's an amazing number. And by the time you're eighty, by the time you're eighty, seventy percent of your peer group are female. Of course, and that's that's like globally. That. So you're having, you know, you start looking at richer countries, and it's actually a little bit bit higher than that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's really it, it's it's mind blowing that that can that that distribution can change so much between forty nine and and eighty. <laughs> All right, I want to get into what the what the older people eat. For a new dear listener, I want to tell you about my new sponsor, Redox Bionutrients. They're not new anymore. We're recording this at the end of April. They've been with me since January 1st. Redox actually was founded by Darren Moon 30 years ago. This is not one of these upstart biologicals with a bunch of tech fund money. He started out in specialty crop. 
and then moved into turf and is now increasingly putting his products in broad acre agriculture. Redox is a, uh, a, a product line that can help you reduce your dependence on traditional fertility products. Redox is helping farmers shift from traditional fertilizers to highly efficient carbon-based technology. Redox bionutrients provide superior nutrition, abiotic stress defense, root growth, soil health, and efficient nutrient uptake. You can find out more about Redox going to redoxgrows.com. That's our website, R-E-D-O-X, redoxgrows.com. Diet of older people, uh, they underconsume calorically. And then you said before we hit the record button, they also tend to consume, um, maybe grandma's getting too many cookies and uh, eating too many uh, uh, coffee cakes and not enough um sausage because there's an underconsumption of protein and that as as people age is what you said which is going to be a problem but maybe also an opportunity for the protein production business yeah so there's a pretty wide variety of nutrient deficiencies that are much more common in older people than in younger people and so as we make this transition i think the big 30,000 foot view is so how is is uh, these how are these eating patterns going to change as the population ages? They're going to be consuming fewer calories, and they need fewer calories, right? But they're under consuming even versus those recommendations. But at the same time, their nutrient requirements don't go down, right? So their their caloric requirements go down because basal metabolism rates tend to slow down as you age. They're, they're, they're less they're active. Going, they're not going. They're not. They're, they're walking versus you know working physical labor and all that they just burn through less stuff so caloric intake goes down and caloric demand or even recommendation goes down right not nutrients because keeping the old body moving still requires nutrients and there's a there's a disconnect right and in in some cases in in some specific nutrients the uh demand may actually go up right because uh, absorption rates uh, tend to go down. Uh, there's a wide variety of reasons why older people would uh, absorb uh, nutrients less efficiently. And if they absorb them less efficiently, they actually need more of them uh, available in the diet. And so what we're talking about here at a big macro level is less calorie dense diets and more nutrient dense diets. So you're talking about things uh, like uh, the B complex, uh, omega three fatty acids, uh, you know, calcium, vitamin D, uh, a lot of those uh, nutrients. But one that really stands out is protein, and and that's not just because I'm from the uh, pork industry. Obviously, it's near and dear to my heart, um, but really one of the more challenging issues in older people, even generally healthy older people, is what they call sarcopenia, which is a, a reduction in muscle mass and actually to some degree bone mass as well. Um, and so as we start thinking about that, protein becomes really, really important. And so the general recommendations, so the official recommendations for older adults is usually somewhere around 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight. Okay. Um, a, Research has shown that about 65% of the population is not even meeting that standard. Okay. So more than half are not even 65% meeting. 65% of that all population or 65% standard. of the elderly population? Uh, 65 plus. Okay. So, um, so about 65% um, of them are failing to meet uh, uh, those you know, lower standards, the, the, the typical traditional standards. But there's a new emerging body of research. It's becoming quite robust that shows that those recommendations for older people uh, should be significantly higher. So you're talking about instead of 0.8, you're talking about 1.0 to 1.2. Mm -hmm. So not marginally higher, drastically higher. And so when you start getting up to that level, you know, 80% plus of the population is probably not meeting those standards. And then there's a third group that are a lot more aggressive uh, that are, you know, probably if you pay attention to human nutrition circles, you've probably heard some of this. Uh, they're arguing that the that even that is not sufficient and that you may be looking at double that. So some people out there are arguing and they have some data to back it up that we're at 0.8 and maybe we need to be at 2.5, right? So we're talking about a massive increase in the requirements for protein in order to facilitate healthy aging. And we're not even meeting the uh, lower standards at this point. So, you know, the, the idea that the protein industry hasn't, you know, jumped on this bandwagon is just absolutely bizarre to me because, I mean, it's very supported by 
the evidence, and we know that's a problem. And so as you think about, you know, what does that look like? Well, we need to be developing protein products, yep. animal-derived protein products that are, you know, uh, that are attractive to older people, you know? And so as you start thinking about that, I think we need to be thinking about, you know, people have dental problems yeah. at that. Yeah, so at that sausage age. is easier than steak. Um, individual packaging, smaller packaging, because once, uh, if you live by yourself and you're 77 years old, male or female, once you open up, you know, pound packages, two pound packages, that's a hell of a lot for a person to go through. I want to point out a couple of things here, Todd, and we're going to talk about the poorer part of it. Cause the big question is, yeah, they need protein, but are they too poor to afford it? Because protein's more expensive than junk food and uh, and cheap carbs. We're gonna get to that. But anyway, well, let me let me give it a shout out too. Like mean, obviously, I'm a pork guy, so I'm hoping the pork gets a big chunk of this uh, massive growing market here. But it, uh, I mean, look at the eggs. I mean, eggs is a huge opportunity to yep. me. I mean, it's an almost an ideal protein, and it's very easy to consume. I mean, there's a lot of different ways you can consume it. So you don't uh, have to. I have think there's a lot of reasons eggs. to be. You the eggs can sit in the refrigerator in the carton for. Uh, you can pull them out one per day, one every other day. They're not going to go bad. There's a, eggs are the perfect protein, and they're affordable, which is going to take care of the cheap part, the the poorer part of it. I, I like that. I want to ask you this question. You've seen these studies that say that there's no underconsumption of protein, but here's the reality. Since oh, since the 80s, they started telling it, they meaning the dietary nutrition guidelines, which are absolute horseshit, generally wrong, misguided. They bring in some you know, left-wing professor from Tufts University that's a vegan and says, we're just eating too much meat. And that's where we've, for every five years, the dietary nutrition guidelines, doesn't matter which president it is, they come out with a food pie chart and a food pyramid, and they've done all this food plates, and everyone that they've done keeps talking about, you got to eat more grains. And one of them, I talked about it in my book, Food Fear, and one of them about, because every five years, it's a new recommendation, How we're all, and all they've done is made people more unhealthy. It said up to 11 servings of grains. I'm like, I, I've raised livestock with less servings of grain than this. So maybe there's a real problem here because- Old people are, well, young people are obese and old people are malnourished nutrient-wise because of this ridiculous recommendations that we've been doing for the last 44 years coming out of the White House telling you eat more grain and cut back on meat. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's all based on science that really was probably not uh, not even real in the first place and has been since debunked anyway, you know? And so, yeah, we need a real, a real shift in, uh, in the nutrition community. And you just see some of the hate that some of these people that are advocating for higher levels of protein, you know, get out there in the media and you kind of get an idea of what forces are, are pushing back on this. And then again, I mean, obviously I'm biased here coming what from forces, the animal protein wait, 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 community. What forces, what forces are, is it the climate crusaders that they get the hate from the diet nutrition, nutrition guideline, vegan crowd? It's, 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 it's both. Um, it's, it's both for sure. Uh, you know, and so there's a big push and that's what I was about to say. There's a big push towards a more plant-based diet and maybe you do need more protein, but uh, you know, you can get it from plant sources and, you know, I just want to be, really clear again i'm biased i've come from the animal protein industry but animal derived proteins are far superior nutritionally to any plant uh, based protein and if you're talking about numbers like i was referencing earlier i mean it's almost impossible to get that much uh, protein with a plant-based diet right so um you know i mean really it's it's that's that where a lot of the hate is coming from the, is that whether they're doing it directly or indirectly they're promoting animal uh, animal-based uh, protein in in people's diets, and obviously the the climate bunch and the vegan bunch are going to push push back against that. All right, let's talk about affordability. Um, yeah, by the way, imagine that bastardized science because of the climate crusade, the climate catastrophe, climate we're all going to die crowd, or because of the vegan crowd. Whoever thought? Um, let's talk about can they afford it? Because we've got this reality that is upon us that I think is actually flying a little bit under the radar right now. Everybody knows they go to the grocery store, and this doesn't matter. It's not just a United States thing. It's a global thing, but most of my listeners live here in the United States. Groceries are up 25% or more since 2020. 
as a general grocery cart. Uh, let's not, you know, eggs are up more and, uh, you know, packaged food is up more. But the point is, you go to the grocery store today, it's up 25% from what it was four years ago. That's significant. Food generally had almost no inflation. Food was on a downward trend from the 80s until four years until four years ago, Todd. As a percentage of Americans' income, food as a percentage of the income was on a downward trajectory for the last four decades until the last three and a half, four years. This is a bad situation. Who gets hurt with food inflation the most? Those at the lower end of the socioeconomic uh, distribution and old people on a fixed income. When we talk about that 80-year-old woman, she probably hasn't worked since she was in her 40s. And I'm not being in any way mean, but generally women retire at a younger age than men. Uh, maybe it could be because they stayed home and raised a kid. Whatever that reason is, their income is not likely to go up. Their income is fixed as fixed gets. It's Social Security, maybe the, some pension funds or whatever those things are. That doesn't go up. 25% grocery increase nails old people right in the pocketbook. Yeah, and so I think I think you know on on one hand there's a there's a group of folks that are out there that are saying, hey, look, the baby boomers are retiring. They did really well. Uh, by the way, the baby boomers will all baby boomers will be retired by twenty or retirement age by twenty thirty. So I mean, we're closing the in on, six the, on the end of that that thing. Um, you know, and so there's an argument that hey, they've they've got all this money, they've done really well, they lived through the you know the boom or whatever. And uh, there's a lot of reasons to you know to support that to believe that but kind of it's almost been the theme of the last several years is that yeah they've got a lot of money but they're also spending a lot of money and you've got social security which is still a pretty significant percentage of that income and it's a very high percentage of the income for for lower income older people um you know and it's on shaky ground right i mean obviously i mean we're, we keep spending and we keep kicking the can down the road politically we don't want to address that issue uh, the reality is, is there's going to be less money available, and it looks like the costs are going to be higher. And so, as it relates to food, maybe that you know mitigates to some degree. Uh, you know, maybe it doesn't. That we can have that discussion. But the other piece is healthcare, and that's very unlikely to those costs are very unlikely to go down. I mean, they've been going up much higher than the rate of inflation, even during those times that you were talking about when the overall inflation was almost nothing. Almost not exactly. Uh, right. You know, the two things that have been really going up is is healthcare and over that whole time period is healthcare and college education, right? And so those are the two kind of outliers in that regard. <clears throat> and obviously that's a huge issue for, for older people. Most of that spending occurs in the last, uh, you know, couple of years to five uh, years of your life. And so, yeah, I think there's an argument to be made that, yes, this is probably the richest group of old people that we've ever had, but they're facing expenses that are you know higher than we've ever seen as well. And I'm not sure that this massive transfer of wealth is actually going to happen because I think they're going to spend a lot of that money on health care and, and maybe a decent chunk of it on food as well. Yeah, I want to I want to actually. Uh tackle the, I will say, uh, illusion that it's that there's this a massive amount of money held out there by these 70-year-old people here in a second. Before I do, speaking of money, I got to make money. That's why I want to help you make money. If you have land and you're a farm person, you might be able to make money on your acres from doing stuff you're already doing or you could do. We're talking about changing some practices to get some sustainability program money from my friends at Truterra. Truterra is a uh, division of Lando Lakes. And the idea is if you put in cover crops, if you strip till, if you do certain things that are good for carbon sequestration, also good for your ground, you can get paid. They have programs you can get signed up for. They're not long term. It can only be a year contract if that's what you want. You might make some bucks on those acres. You can learn more by going to truterraag.com trueterraag.com. There's all kinds of different programs and you might find a fit for you. You can also sign up through your ag retailer if they happen to be uh, a, D a Lando Lakes dealer. All right. Um, there was a Wall Street article a week or so ago. Baby boomers are st sitting on their large homes because it's they're mostly paid for and they're worth a, a chunk of money and they don't want to uh, you know, downsize, et cetera. So they talked about the wealth this idea that these people are sitting on massive amounts of money, they've got some retirement funds and they've got some real estate. But 
as you said, let's just say that they decide they want to help their grandkid in college, unless this is all paid for by Joe Biden. But uh, it, you're talking about at 30 grand a year, that money goes away pretty quickly. We've also seen the baby boom generation is very much the American, uh, the new American, meaning if you give them 10 grand, I think they spend 10 grand. So I, I don't think that all of a sudden they're going to approach their 80s with this vast amounts of um, held wealth that then they're allowed to just go ahead and spend it on higher end groceries. I think we're going to see a poorer consumer. And we're going to definitely see a poorer, older consumer. The the crowd that's 65, that's retirement age plus, I think gets poorer in real dollars, real inflation adjusted dollars when they walk down the grocery aisle. And I, yeah. and I agree with you. I don't I, I, and we're not talking about the 84-year-old poor old grandma, you know, her husband retired from the factory and he's been dead for 33 years and she's just living off of a pensioner's fund. I'm talking about the the 70-year-old that are still pretty spry. They're going to hold up, but they can burn through money pretty quickly. And if these entitlement uh, these entitlement uh, programs get a little shaky, you, you see a poorer customer, a poorer 75-year-old walking down the grocery aisle five years from now, because I certainly do. I think it's I think it's certainly possible. And I think the big question in behavioral economics right now is how are these older people going to spend? Right. Uh, or is their spending patterns going to change? Are the baby boomers different in that regard, too? So, um, you know, that's a big question. And I certainly wouldn't pretend to be able to predict what's what's going to happen there. I think there are some indications that they are going to continue to spend at rates that were higher than what older Previous generations uh, spent, but uh, you know to what degree? Hard to say. And then you really start thinking about that next generation. The, the more the I mean, reality is the more the baby boomers spend, the the less they're going to leave to the to to Gen X and the <laughs> and the generations behind them. So um, it'll be you know it'll be I think one of the bigger stories from an economics perspective of the next twenty years will be. You know what is the what is the uh, security of these retired people as that uh, that life expectancy continues to creep up? Hopefully, we've kind of been on a uh, kind of going the wrong direction in the last few years uh, there. But um, you know, I, I think that's the that's the big question. And I think assuming that an older generation, ten years from now, is going to have more resources available to them, is a very shaky assumption. And I think you could very well be right that you're talking about, you're certainly going to talk about an older, older consumer. On we've already average, established the older. We've already, resources. we've already established the older. And then there's somebody that's going to say, yeah, but Todd, you already talked about the, the immigration. What if we bring another 8 million immigrants in, which we already have in the last three years? Won't that balance out? Yes. But then we'll still have a significant number. Okay. The percentage will be a little bit skewed from what you've already projected. But we'll still have a boatload of elderly consumers. Um, so I, I think that we still need to be prepared for this. A, I'm seeing it's an opportunity for protein, but it's hard for the protein industry to change how they've always marketed. Uh, and as you said, those that come out and say we need to be eating t two to three times the amount of protein for nutrient density uh, for old people, they get attacked by the vegan climate crowd. But that's okay. We should we should take that head on, which our trade groups, if we're relying on the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, it'll never happen because they're one of the most useless trade groups in the history of trade groups. But the, the pork people could take it on because they're actually good. They get marketing. I could see that being uh, an opportunity, you know, pork for uh, pork for healthy aging kind of thing. Um I don't see I don't see the the older person that we were established as older being able to have the affordability to eat as well as they even do right now is my concern because this inflation that we've been told is transitory since 2021 when the government invented the inflation is very sticky. I don't see it going away in one, two, three, or four years. Well, and I, and I think it gets back to, you know, an, another conversation that we just really desperately need to have, not just as an industry, but as a society around, you know, is cheap food the right policy? You know, that has been the 
the overarching policy for the past well, as long as I've been around, since the, US, since the uh, USDA was in, 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 in instituted, right? Right. What so, about? are we going to are we going to make a shift? I and mean, we talked about a a shift from caloric density to nutrient density has you know profound implications for food and ag. What does how does that impact the affordability of that food? You know, if we we need to move in that direction, and there's a lot of reasons. This is just one of them that we're talking about. The, the reason we need to move in that direction. Uh, you know, how does that impact the affordability of food? And I mean, it's just bizarre to me. I mean, hardly anybody's talking about this. The, if you're hosting a ag conference of any sort and you're not talking about these demographic changes um, and how they're going to impact demand for uh, ag commodities and the consumption patterns on food, I mean, it's just it's beyond me why why we're not having this discussion, why it's not a prominent discussion. You bring up poor, you bring up cheap food, which I talked about it in my book and said, it's time to stop talking about cheap food. Because I wrote the book five years ago and and we had a cheap fooded and cheap fooded and cheap fooded ourselves down to where there's no margin. And now we, you know, the inflation situation over the last three and a half years has made it so that cheap food is in vogue again. There's a lot of people that's like, yeah, hell, give me some of that cheap food. <laughs> I want it. Do we get back to cheap food? The problem is, why I see grocery store inflation and restaurant inflation even worse not subsiding is labor. It's not because we can't make pork uh, fairly affordable, especially now with you know four dollar and twenty cent corn and eleven dollar and fifty cent soybeans. We can probably make pork and poultry for sure more affordable. It's not us. That's the problem on food affordability at the restaurant levels because you try and get a waiter or waitress to show up and actually work. Try and get a line cook to come in and actually show up and cook. And then at the grocery stores, there's a lot of hands that touch that food from the from the meat processing facility to the cold storage to the trucking to the distribution to the person that puts it on the shelf to the person that then uh, you know helps you out of the car if they still do such a thing. Food inflation is going to be a problem because of the labor. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's almost un- unavoidable. And and again, it just gets back to that that conversation. I mean, everybody hates the cheap food until the food prices start to go up and then everybody starts screaming. I mean, it's it's really bizarre that you if you just follow sort of the the pulse of, you know, even social media where, you know, there's this, you know, everybody hates, you know, cheap food. We need to do better. We need to have higher quality food and, you know, mission accomplished on the on the on the meeting caloric needs and we need to move on to this next phase. And then you get a little bit of inflation in at the grocery store and people just absolutely freak out. And so I'm like, what do you think, you know, an end to cheap food looks like? I mean, this is basically what it looks like. I mean, you're talking about not just inflation, but like a fundamental increase of maybe 15 to 20 percent in the in the cost to get that food to you. And that's not you know, they had the whole discussion about whether inflation was transitory or not, but that's certainly not going to be transitory if we have to, you know, adjust production practices to, you know, meet this need for more nutrient dense food. That's what you're looking at. You're looking at a 15 to 20 percent increase in the cost to produce that food. And here's the other part of it. It seems that we're fighting policy. Um, right now, everything out of Washington, D.C., including our own United States Department of Agriculture is, is uh, uh bandying about climate smart agriculture which doesn't mean anything it's it's just a it's just a term uh, climate smart agriculture that we're not hearing uh protein for the people we're not hearing um uh, let's let's uh let's adequately prepare for an aging and and unfortunately economically stripped down population uh we could have USDA policy you know, that uh, on SNAP and the EBT cards that said, no, the only items you can purchase with that are things with greater nutrient density instead of Mountain Dew and Doritos. And I like Doritos just fine. I'm not being any way mean. I'm a big fan of Doritos, not so much the Mountain Dew. But uh, the, the point I'm saying is none of the policy is working this direction. And we're we can see this. You and I can both see the aging and we can also see the economic uh, striation that's going to end up becoming economic. I don't want to say struggle, but it's going to be. We're we are definitely dealing with when the, when energy is where it is price wise, and food is where it is price wise. And you're talking about people on fixed incomes that might be seniors making thirty two thousand dollars a year between their investments and their social security. They're getting squeezed hard, and I don't see any policy that's going to address that. 
Yeah, and, and, and really it's just, you know, like we've talked about several times in, in several different contexts, all of these systems have been built around this, you know, cheap food, uh, you know, produce more and more and more, the feed the world, you know, all that stuff that we've talked about, mm -hmm. um, commodity mindset, you know, all of our systems, existing structures are really built around that assumption. So turning that ship around is is not easy. You have to, you're going to have to uh, reverse, well, you know, the in, problem in a lot is of we, ways, we, 180 we're still, reverse. But we're still making lots of it. Right now, the problem, the, the, the grocery stores aren't where they are because of a lack of productive capacity. It's because of the, the energy and the labor. Right. And then insurances and all those other things. The the price of food is back to the point of it not really having a whole heck of a lot to do with the the production of the gallon of milk or the uh, even the eggs or the the pound of bacon. Right? It's right. it's hands. It's human hands. It's transportation. It's insurance and it's energy. Yeah. So what you know? What are those limitations? I mean, you know, all of our systems today are designed to try to keep us from starving to death, basically. Um, you know, to, to prevent us from starving to death. And you know, it, we've achieved that. You know, and then not that we need to completely forget about that. I mean, obviously, right. you know, we, we've got to you know have systems in place to make sure that we are able to feed the population. But you know, that is now no longer a, a primary concern. It's not even on the you know, very high on the list of, of of priorities there. We really need to be thinking about how do we feed people differently. And our and our incentive structures just aren't aligned for that. I mean, if you start looking at, you know, why do we do what we do? We've talked about it, you know, before on the protein side. Yeah. You know, why is pork so lean? Why don't we put some fat back in the pork? Why don't we change the size of the steaks and, you know, stuff like that? Well, it's because the incentive structures are aligned to get what we get. And unless we change the incentive structures, we're going to keep getting the same thing. Are you optimistic that, uh, or, or are you a pessimist? Again, we asked the question, an older, poorer customer is agriculture ready. We've established, and we, we think both both reasons why, um, you say, the, what should we be doing? What What is, well, are you optimistic that we can make the changes? I, I'm absolutely optimistic that we can make the changes. I mean, you'd be hard pressed to find a group of people that is more, you know, fundamentally optimistic and adaptable. Um, I mean, we we clearly we clearly can do it. I mean, if if any group of people can do it, it's it's agriculture. I have I have unlimited optimism in our ability to do it. Uh, what I'm less optimistic about is whether our leadership, industry leadership, our political leadership, is going to put us down the right path to focus those efforts and those talents and resources and skills and all those things that we've developed on a new challenge and provide the incentive structure to to make that happen. Uh, that I'm much less confident in. And I'm, I'm concerned that, I mean, eventually they're going to have to, you know, they're eventually they're not going to have any choice. But the longer you wait on those transitions, the more painful those transitions are. And that's, you know, I, I have kind of said before on many different, in many different contexts, Humans are really good at adapting to the current, you know, situation yeah. Yeah. and not very good at long-term planning. And I think that's <laughs> becoming a increasingly uh, uh, disadvantageous characteristic. And, uh, and we need to really work on strategies for being able to address that issue and, and get better at, at understanding where these things are going and, you know, developing strategies for these things before they blow up. I mean, I mean, we all know everybody that's paying attention knows, for example, that Social Security is going to become, you know, bankrupt. Right. I mean, everybody knows that and nobody wants to do anything about it. Right. right? So um, well, those are political. You know, those are political things more than on the industry side. I mean, we are guided by political wins and the USDA and all that. But there's a lot of things we could be doing proactively on our own. I mean, if I think there's a, a real investment opportunity here, we talk about money. If, if I'm sitting on, you know, Rob Syke and I asked the question in a summer episode, if I had a billion dollars, where would I invest it? It's got me thinking food, uh, a food initiative, food processing, I don't know, food manufacturer that that is targeting food for an aging population. I mean, there really is, um, there, there really looks like an opportunity there, which of course, I guess there needs to be the affordability factor. Uh, and the convenience uh, and portion size, I think. Well, and, and I, I do want to mention, you know, I, I've been doing a lot of uh, modeling 
uh, trying to do some uh, fairly long-term projections, which has turned out to be a, a lot bigger challenge than I think I anticipated. Um, but one thing that has come up is there's not a lot of research on some of these issues. And so that's what I mean, you know, what can the industry do? You know, probably there's people out there that are listening to this that have an influence on what kind of research gets done um, in food and agriculture and exploring in more detail, better understanding how older people's nutritional needs change and all of these other factors that come into play. I mean, you know, it's not just we talked a lot about, you know, metabolic things and, you know, human nutrition, um, but there's also some social issues. You know, older people tend to have fewer friends. You've got this loneliness epidemic. You know, a lot of food is consumed in a social context, right? And so when you have older people that are, you know, that don't have those uh, strong social connections, family connections like they used to, that's one of the reasons they don't uh, consume enough food, right? They don't have the motivation to go out to dinner with their friends or have family over and, you know, things like that. So, I mean, there's a, there's a thousand different angles you can take at this and there's just a real lack of, of good, solid research and surveys and, and things like that out there, we really need some more data. I mean, it's hard, very hard to dig up uh, conclusive uh, results of research in this space. So that's definitely something it's, it's beyond me why that hasn't happened. And, and, and it definitely needs to. We're up against the clock here. Uh, I think what I, I, I hope that the people that listen and watch this, and we've got really good viewers and listeners. And by the way, if you're a listener and you want to be a viewer, go to my YouTube channel. It's the Damian Mason channel. Just go to YouTube, type in Damian Mason channel and hit subscribe. It's free and you'll get all of my episodes there, plus all the other commentary videos we put out. And also you can watch it on Acres TV. But the point is, I, I hope that someone gets a hold of me and says, hey, you know what? We are a company that is absolutely um, looking at uh, um, having a, a product mix for an older, poorer customer. Because we, a lot of times, you and I bring up stuff that a lot of folks in ag just don't talk about. You know, we're real good at production. We focus on that. And we've heard all the usual stuff about, uh, you know, the same uh, trite, uh, overdone statements forever about feeding the world. This is a big thing. And this is an absolute economic situation that is going to, I think, change uh, some outcomes in, in agriculture five and 10 years from now. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's not. I mean, th these are things that are happening now. I mean, we're not talking about things that are going to happen, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now. We're talking about things that are beginning to happen and are only going to accelerate from here. Food inflation. I'm recording this. He and I, Todd and I are recording this at the end of April of 2024. So maybe you're listening to this in 2026 and you're like, hey, man, Damien, you were wrong. Inflation didn't stick around. I, I would love to be wrong. But I'm telling you, the history, economic, uh, the economic history tells me that inflation doesn't just uh, spike like, a, like, like it has, like a damn geyser. Uh, in a year and then go away because there was contributory influences that created it. And that's where we are right now. So this is something that you said is not 10 years down the road. We've been dealing with this inflation now for three and a half years. And I think we got another three and a half. I really do. Unfortunately, we're the consumer. Um, if you want to catch more with Todd and I, he's recorded a number of episodes with me. Go back and check it out. Just go, go and do the search. You can listen to the podcast wherever you get your podcast, you know, all the different places from SoundCloud and, you know, Apple iTunes, all that kind of stuff. But the point is, um, you also can catch he and I at the Business of Ag Success Group. Every other Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern, we have a Zoom call with about two or so dozen of our closest friends. That's a network of agricultural professionals. We get together and we have straight talk about industry goings on. And we bring on industry guests. For $99 a month, you can become a member. There's no long-term subscription. And you can get the brilliance of Todd Thurman every other Friday. I personally look forward to it. Anyway. Thanks for being here. And by the way, and his mom's warming up to me. That's been the biggest thing about all this. Now that he and I have been doing this for four years, his mom is warming up to me, and I I couldn't be happier. Great news. Yeah, it's great news. All right. His name is Todd Thurman. My name is David Mason. Thanks to, for being here. Until next time, this is The Business of Agriculture. Well, that concludes another fantastic episode of The Business of Agriculture. This episode was brought to you by Pattern Ag. You know, everybody in agriculture understands the importance of soil health. We also keep an eye on our soil better than we ever did through advanced soil testing. But what if there was a company that provided predictive analytics? Not just checking out nutrients and all the elements that are in there, but also could tell you the degree of risk you face with disease and pest pressure. 
That's right. Pattern Ag can do that. They actually can tell you, hey, you're going to have a real issue here. You can preemptively, proactively treat for corn rootworm or cyst nematode or sudden death syndrome before the problem actually starts costing you yield. Go to pattern.ag, that's www.pattern.ag to find the nearest rep that can help you start doing better for your soil. 